Today I'm with James Sinclair Entrepreneur. He started off as a clown all the way through to having a 40 million pound business empire. And I actually can't believe he's sharing these tips and advice for free. Come and check it out. If you're looking to grow your trades business, then there's no better person than who I've got with me today. It's James Sinclair. James, how are you? Thanks for having me on the show. I'm going to start where I always start. Yeah. How did you get into the trades? Well, my first trade was uh, not the traditional sense like lots of your viewers and listeners. I was a, a magician, but I was a tradesman. You know, I was doing swapping time for money. I was a sole trader going out there. Um, I was 16, 17. And from a very young age, bringing in like 1,500 quid a week. But I was working for it. You know, I was out there seven days a week, you know, working till midnight most nights. And I saved all that money up. And I realised I was swapping time for money and I wanted to turn it into a business. So for the trades guys, this is the same as being on the tools effectively. So that was your version of being just magic on the tools. Wands and, just magic wands and playing cards. Yeah. <laughs> and how did it evolve then? Where did the entrepreneurial side come from? And the... Well, I, I built up a quite an impressive database of customers that kept on asking for more and more and so I trained up other magicians other people to be on the tours other entertainers and they would go out and I would take a cut of their work um, problem with that is quite low barrier to entry so they would I would build their diaries up and then they would just leave me yeah. and um, take all my customers so the, the demand was that were you marketing or was it just people liked what you did and then I it was think, very I much think, word of mouth at that point or like any trade or any you know, skilled service, people go to the person they trust. And if that person they trust is fully booked, but they recommend someone, that's, you know, that risk reversal for them to go, well, that person's been recommended, I'll use them. And that's what I was doing, but I effectively turned it into a business um, and uh, we traded it. Mm -hmm. And how then, How if, if there is a trades business owner who is stuck on that on the tools sort of mentality, they swapping the time for money effectively what would be your advice to take that step back and, and try and come back from that and build a team well first of all I think you need to, it's a mindset position first of all to say no that's what I want because lots of people say that mm -hmm. but in reality they don't take the steps to do that so I was an entertainer a magician and I wanted to open visitor attractions so I would take steps to do that so I would do entertainment at visitor attractions get to know the owners and the managers find people that have done it get mentorship from them maybe they don't even know that you're they're mentoring you but you see what they're doing study what they're doing understand that success leaves clues and then I sort of stole little bits from successful people and put it up into a little book of greatness and then mimicked those habits if you like yeah. and so the first stage is well decide what you want find out who's already got it then what did they do to attain that and then work out what you got to become and what you got to do to have what you really want to have mm -hmm. and so um, first thing I did was employ a lady called Jean that came in my nan's spare bedroom and done all my admin so that gave me the time when I wasn't on the tours to go out there and get more customers and think about the bigger picture of the business. Yeah. And I, a lot of people are not comfortable with this, but all the successful entrepreneurs that I've met are prepared to invest in other people, i.e. management, uh, before paying themselves. And that's quite difficult for people to grasp. Well, hang on a sec, they're going to be taking a slice of their profit, putting it into management before I get more money for myself. But actually, it's a brilliant investment. And what I would always say to people, a lot of people are very happy to invest £50,000, £100,000 into a buy-to-let property or put it into their pension or do some stuff like that for quite menial returns in the early stages. I mean, obviously, if you hold assets for long enough, they can grow quite fast. But actually, you could put finding the right person, put a salary payment in, mm -hmm. they could triple the size of your business inside yeah. one year and grow the profits of your business. But you've got to be good yourself to make sure you're employing the right people. That's a good point. I, I think the I'm picking up on the definitely when I'm, when like I do a bit of a mentorship for trades business owners looking to sort of grow their, their, their business. And a lot of the time what I say to them is they need to offload that admin. So it's like a very similar journey. I know that... Um, 
you know that you're no trades as such but it's like it's just a universal language it's exactly the same it's, it's like it's whether you're a baker uh, yeah. you know a butcher it's all the same and then, stuff and then it, it, it's like going through those levels of you then need to learn marketing and you then need to learn sales because if you start to build you get someone to take the admin then you get then you build a team who can actually do the on the tools stuff then you've got to actually make sure there's enough coming in. The to, fastest to way that. to grow a small business is the owner spends more time growing their business than operating their business. And if you get that into your mindset, I'm spending more time growing my business than operating my business, you will very, very quickly recoup any cash that you've put in. So if I was an electrician, yeah. so I would change my mindset to say I am the sales and marketing machine of my electrical business and I would employ an electrician straight away. Then I would learn lots of marketing and sales techniques to bring in more cash flow to employ more electricians. Yeah, and you always, you always try and get an electrician who would be better than you probably like and Maybe. enjoys doing it. Yeah, but... Like, no, not necessarily are. Yeah, but I, I just think if you want to be very super successful, you've got to learn how to bring in cash flow. Yeah. You've got to... The, the mindset, the first mindset is I am a salesperson of my electrical company. Stop saying you're an electrician. Yeah. That's the... It's an identity yeah, shift, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where do you think that comes from the most? Is it the books and the mentorship and just... I just think really successful... We, we spoke about, we had a little pre-chat, Tra spoke about Charlie Mullins, and I've interviewed Charlie Mullins, arguably the most successful tradesperson in the United Kingdom. Um, and if you ask him what he does, and he always says, I spend 90% of my time on sales, marketing, and PR. Mm -hmm. He is a person that brings in cash flow into that business. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And if that, that he's, he's made the mindset change. Yeah. He, what is, you know, he was on the tools for the littest amount of possible, yeah. And then he's gone, right, I'm not operating this business, I'm growing it. Yeah. I'm going to go out there and get yeah. customers. So it's a, it is a case then that it's, it's, I've heard you saying this multiple times, start with the end in mind. Yeah, yeah. So it's starting with the end in mind. If the end in mind is to sell the business, exit it, have it running without you. Well, what I say is you should always build a business to sell, even if you have no intention of selling it, because that discipline makes you build a better business. Yeah. So it's not that we're building it necessarily to sell us because we want the discipline. Yeah. Yeah, if it's running if it's running yeah. good enough, you could choose to sell it because yeah. it would be an investment well, for someone else. it's running good enough that someone goes, hello, I'd like to buy yeah. it. That's when it's yeah. the best. And, and probably at that stage, you're then not a, you're not like a seller in panic mode. You're the you're, shareholder. You're, yeah, you're, you're, you're basically saying, look, it's a good investment. You could take, yeah. you could take it if you want. If you look at, I talk about this process called the entrepreneur's pyramid. So 85% of entrepreneurs are working on the tools in whatever business they are, whether they're the butcher, the candlestick maker, the electrician, whatever it is, they're on the tools, they're technicians of their business, but they also own the business. Yeah. And as we move up the entrepreneur's pyramid, the, you know, you've got this 80% at the bottom doing the day-to-day, -day. they're sheeps of the business, they're solopreneurs, in many cases. The next stage up is the entrepreneur, the, about 15% of the marketplace. They're starting to put in systems and processes and management in place. And then the top 5%, they're owners. Yeah. They're shareholders. And they've put all of the technicians in place, all the management in place. And actually owners of businesses, shareholders of businesses are looking for the best MD, CEOs and heads of departments for their business. Yeah. It makes sense. And they just turn up to a board meeting and say, what are we doing to innovate this business? What are we doing to market this business? And how are we making sure our culture's on point? Because if your culture's on point, it drives sales and profitability. And if you want to see a business that has culture on point, just walk into an Apple shop and you will see that person selling you that iPhone or that Mac believes in the culture of that business. And that's why they sell more retail per square foot than any other retailer in the world because they're on innovation, marketing, and culture. Mm -hmm. I think it's just understanding that it's an actual, like it's a, it's a long-term thing as well. Like yeah. taking that step off the tools, it can yeah. be quite daunting. And then you're, you're almost like a novice of, if you're sales, marketing, you're, you're a novice of those things, but it's yeah. just about learning it, getting in, and getting well, better always, and improving. Jamie, what I always say to people is that if you're going to go on the path of entrepreneurship, you are a risk taker. Mm. There is no comfort blankets. And so you want to be building something to sell because you don't want to get to the end and try and sell a profitable job because no one wants to buy yeah. a job. 
they might as well go and get a job with all the security that comes with the job, holiday paid, you don't have to think about it at weekends. If you're going down the path of business ownership, therefore, you've got a lot more responsibility. You want to be rewarded for that by one day having a liquidity or a wealth day when you sell your business. And to sell your business, you've got to make it look like an investment, not a profitable job. And then what I always tell people is why are Brits, I mean, up to now, maybe the things are changing a bit on there, why were they happy to buy buy to let property investments? Mm -hmm. That's a big thing that British people, UK people loved doing is because they know that that's a hands-off investment. They're putting some cash in, they're gonna get a monthly return, and then hopefully in 20 years time, that pile of bricks will be worth more than what they paid for it now. We want to take that discipline, that philosophy that you would have on an investment, whether you're buying shares in Google or Disney or something, we want to put that into our little business. Mm -hmm. Having that mindset, how are we going to build this so that someone else wants to buy it? So that you're removed from the process. You're investing in it yourself rather than these things over here. And think in a 10-year process. It's a a marathon, not a sprint, this. You know, you don't, you've got to have good accounts, you know, that repeat year after year, good systems, good processes, great reviews, awards, great culture, um, IPs if you need that around your business. Something that's so desirable, someone wants to give you money for it because they see it as an investment. Yeah. And you think about investments, people sometimes, like pension funds pay 13 times for a business's profitability. Lots and lots of sole traders end up just giving their business away. Mm-hmm. Because it's cheaper to give it away than close it down. And that's the thing. I think there's there's a lot of ego in the in the trades. And I probably had that at the beginning as well. When I first um, I went to a networking meeting and that was even alien to me at that point. And when I got there, I met this business coach chap and he said, you don't own a business, you just own a job. And like well, that's most I took it really hard because I had yeah. a couple of vans, they were yeah. sign written, I had the uniforms, we were delivering jobs, we were, we were making a bit of money. And I thought, this is a business. But then once it settled and I and allowed to, I, I remo- removed the ego. Yeah, yeah. He gave me a book called the E Myth. Yeah, and yeah. And then it's I, a I went, I, I, I read that, and then it all started to make sense. And and sometimes we just need to get beyond that ego, and that's what I would encourage any trades, you know, any tradesman or or self-employed trades person like they. It's it's making that decision to actually grow a business because then it is an investment, and it's yeah, pro- yeah, it's yeah. the biggest the the biggest investment I would say you can invest in is. Probably one yourself, but then Absolutely. two the actual your actual business, the thing you're trying to build yeah, to, yeah. like you say, building it to to sell, even but, if you have no intention of selling it. But if you uh, so a tradesman, say they earn seventy to a hundred k a year by working on the tools, they're having a nice lifestyle, then they've got to employ someone to be on the tools so they can grow the business. Their personal income might drop for a year. Yeah. And that is a big barrier for people to get over. Yeah. And you've just got to go through that. Yeah. But you can only do that if you do have that. Yeah, they might be for a year, they might only earn 30 grand. Yeah. Because they're paying someone else why it yeah. goes to the next level. But some people could say, I just cannot physically do that. I just, you know. And is that why they stay stuck? I think so, yeah. Because that's not just trades guys, that's no. everyone, isn't it? All businesses, yeah. And they just stay stuck then. Yeah, and, then and I've always wanted to employ people in br- brilliant managers. Yeah. So I believe in a philosophy for business success called E plus M equals S. So entrepreneurship, which you certainly are, plus management equals success. Mm-hmm. And if you have too much entrepreneurship and not enough management, the whole thing pops because yeah. the entrepreneur, let's do this, let's do that, let's go, let's go, let's push it, let's yeah. push it. That's the DNA yeah. of an entrepreneur, right? Where managers are much more steady eddy systems and processes. They don't want to innovate. Mm-hmm. They want everything working they're like engineers if you like you know they're 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 just making sure everything's humming at the perfect beat you know and and then every now and then you know the entrepreneur pushes again the manager has to fix it yeah make the engine work a bit harder and and but the entrepreneur goes for gold when they know they've got really good managers around them yeah because it gives them the confidence to push themselves further and i guess sometimes you just have to stretch them as well so you be that entrepreneur and you take a little a risk and it stretches yeah, your and management. Yeah, the manager holds you they... back and goes, well, what are you doing here, Jamie? Yeah. This is too much. Yeah. You know, like, we can't do this. And you're like, yes, you can. We can do this. And that, that yin and yang then pushes it yeah. forward. Yeah. Um, the best way of thinking about it really is, you know, I always use the philosophy of running a school. The head teacher is the entrepreneur and the teachers are the manager. Mm-hmm. You know, a really good dynamic head teacher pushes the school forward. Yeah. 
but he can only do that or she can only do that on the strength of the quality of the teachers, yeah. the managers that are looking after the students. Yeah. And, and I think that's the perfect analogy for most people to go, I get it. Yeah. I'm either head teacher and the teacher. If you do both, you usually do both bad and usually burn out. Yeah. See, so if we go back to like the e-myth sort of, it's the, uh, the entrepreneur, the manager and the technician. Yeah. Sort of covered the three of those there. Now, all of us trades guys, we, we started as a technician. We probably moved to the manager at one point. I remember being like the sort of general manager in my business before I moved into more of that entrepreneurial role. Do you think the technician might think that they're no possible, like they're, they couldn't do these other parts? Would, have you ever seen a case where they are the best person to stay in that technician and then oh, they would bring yeah. someone else in to do yeah, that? Some people, you know, every business owner will promote someone above their ability. Let's, but let's look at salespeople, for example, because yeah. I think that's another great analogy where people get it. You've got the best salesman, they're performing, they're making the business lots of money. Yeah. And then we say, you are now the sales manager. So you're now managing all the salespeople based on the performance of your best sales. Mm. But you might not be the best person to manage people. Mm. And then you've just ruined their life. <laughs> you haven't trained them. You haven't, yeah. And actually what would be better is to actually get an office manager there's an admin person that follows up, that's organised to manage all the salespeople yeah. and leave the best salesperson in the salesperson role. Because that person is like a one-man army in many yeah, respects. Yeah. It doesn't mean that they'll be good at, at actually managing. Yeah, and usually salespeople are critically awful yeah. at managing people. They're very good at making money. It's like entrepreneurs yeah. usually make, me included, hands up, terrible managers. They might be great leaders, yeah. very good leaders, but not managers. And I, I always reference prime ministers and presidents around the world. Usually you've got an inspirational leader that's a terrible manager that can bring people with them, but they can't manage detail. Yeah. Um, and, and if you look at, you know, because I don't want to get political about it, but if you look at great inspirational leaders, they've usually surrounded themselves with good managers. Yeah. Like Theresa May, was, in my opinion, not a very inspirational prime minister. But I actually, I think she was a very good manager of stuff, got stuff done, good at detail, yeah. and she was put in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and if you put people in the wrong place, you got to be big enough to say, look, no, this isn't for you. It's, it makes sense, that, and it's the, the whole get the, the right people on the bus and then put them in the right seats analogy, yeah, yeah, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. I, th I, think, I think on paper a lot of it can be quite simple. Like when you say things like those analogies, like get the, the right people on the bus, then put them in the right seats. There sometimes can be a problem with that because like people have got but personalities. Before the, bus, or... before the bus on trades, you've got to have the mindset that I want to employ people. Yeah. And, you know, if you look, lots of trades people, oh, they've got subcontractors, they do everything they can not to have the responsibility mm -hmm. of employment. Mm -hmm. So what, you get your fingers burnt, you know. Yeah. You, you then go again. I always say you have to kiss a few frogs yeah. to find your prince. You know, but you want to build it up. Because if I was buying an investment, if I was buying shares in Google, and I said, well, who's the CEO? And they said, well, he's a subcontractor. That's it. No, I want him in the seat running the bloody company. Yeah. You know, you don't want the head teacher of a school being part-time and then can go and run four or five schools for me to choose my children to go to that school. I want to have faith that the leadership and the management is constant, is being nurtured. And, and when you meet really good people that build big trades businesses, they've got over that hill. No, I... My job is to find the best possible people, keep them, and keep going. Mm -hmm. See, me, I'm always recruiting. Yeah. If I meet someone today, and I think, oh, they're really good, I'm, I want to employ them. You'll find just, a place in your I'll business find for a place them. for them. They need to be in there. Yeah, yeah. So you've got like, to think that. So it's like values first, or like you see somebody who can really yeah, get stuff done. if I go for a meal, like, and I see a really good waiter or a good restaurant manager, I go up and give them my card and say, look, you're fantastic. Yeah. If you ever want to move jobs, please call me. This is who I am. Yeah. Because I've watched them work. Yeah. And I'm like, that person I need and to And there's employ. no hiding that, is there? Because they're, no. they're in their comfort zone at that point. And they they're don't not, know who I yeah, am. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's almost like a secret shopper idea. Yeah. So uh, if we could touch a wee bit on then. So you, you started off as the, the entertainer and we've, we've, we've filled loads of um, good wee golden nuggets there. What sort of have you done with, with your businesses then, like folding that stuff in? And you've, like, I know you've done so much with the commercial yeah. properties. And so so my, my view on business is, uh, vertical integration as the 
you know, private equity, venture capitalist, investor term for it. So, you know, I have a rule. If we're spending over £100,000 with something, should we be doing it in-house? Mm -hmm. So a great point for that is we buy lots of printing in for our, like signage and um, our, our large format printers, banners. So I bought all the equipment, employed someone to do it in-house. Now, it still costs me and our business has grown £80,000 a year. And you think, oh, is it worth it for a £20,000 saving, for example? Mm -hmm. But actually, we now get half a million pounds worth of value because we get more, 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 yeah. lots more, more, and we control it, and I can let our teams have it all the time. And if I see something, I can go, yeah, let's just get it done, and we can get it tomorrow. We don't go in a waiting yeah. game. Now, we spend over a million pounds in uh, with a supplier on food and drink. So I want to create a food services business. And so... I've bought a big food services business, an ice cream company, because it was buying more than a quarter of a million pounds worth of ice cream. Let's just buy an ice cream company. And then my hotel, where we're recording this today, my zoos and visitor attractions, all buy from that business, keeping the cash flow sloshing around the ecosystem. So yeah, I, I call it making sure you're buying subsidiary services that fold into your existing empire. So if I owned your business, I'd probably want to buy uh, like a, a builder's merchant. Yeah. Or like scaffolding, bring the yeah, scaffolding yeah, in house. Yeah, and a scaffolding company. I'm sure you yeah. told me to do that when I was doing the business broadcast yeah, so, last time. Well, that, what's good about that? So, so your business, you know, is a, a three million turnover business and you see a scaffolding business that's a two million turnover business and they're, you're making a few hundred thousand, they're making a few hundred thousand, bolting them together. There's probably some economies of scale and a hundred thousand pounds worth of admin savings that then bolsters both businesses up. It makes your business more protected. The scaffolding Holding business probably refer you more work because the customer's the same. The roofing company refers yeah, the yeah. scaffolding business more work. And then overnight on that acquisition, your business is becoming more of an investment than a business yeah. because it's a bigger thing. And it's much more attractive for the marketplace to buy bigger businesses than smaller yeah. businesses. It's the convenience as well. Like yeah. just like the same as you saying, we'll put a sign up there tomorrow. We could say, all right, we'll get our scaffolders to put that scaffold up there or you need an alteration. It's, yeah. it's sometimes... There's a real, real balance between outsourcing and, and bringing things in-house. Hi guys, sorry to interrupt the episode, but I just wanted to say a massive thank you to Scope Brandon for being our new podcast sponsor. As you're aware, if you've been listening and following the podcast, I'm really big on my branding and having branded workwear. We've teamed up with these guys. They've done all our work at Taylor Roofs, Taylor Solar, and now the Taylor Talks brand here that you can see. They're good quality, good prices, and really good service. Go and connect with Scope Branding on their social media channels, check out their website, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. Good people, they're a business that's not really growing. They're thinking, oh, should I go? Is there going to be opportunities for me? You start doing a bit of this, and you're yeah. seeing your people thinking, this is a place to be, baby. You see, you see you're growing at it. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's, there's going to be opportunities in yeah. a couple of years for me. Yeah. It's, it's just getting... No, it's just getting trades people to take that step do you know I, I think I don't know if it's that there's a fear or there's just a they just don't think they'll be able to do it but it's just cro crossing over that threshold all that stuff you're speaking about there like none of that is possible if you if you don't step off the tools no but then at the same but time but it's in every industry there, you know the beauticianist yeah. that's still doing the nails she's not growing her business is yeah. she you know the dentist that's yeah. still doing the teeth yeah. you know I know a very successful dentist that I've done consultancy for you know, he's a fully qualified dentist, but got out of his business and he's now got 10 practices. Yeah. But he's a qualified dentist. Yeah. You know, and, and for him, he had the same thing, you know, earning 150 grand a year as a dentist. Yeah. I've got to pay someone 150 grand a year, but I'm not going to be on the tour, so I'm going to stop earning. Yeah. So he's got this desert period where he's not replacing his income. But now, oh, mamma mia, yeah, right. he's bish bash bosh, <laughs> he's got loads of dosh. Yeah. And... And what what do you think you would what do you do in that interim period where it's like the cash flow is obviously going to take a hat and you're paid but, somewhere else and you're seen it? Well, you you got to is develop it, yourself so you know that that's going to happen. Yeah. Because yeah. when you know that's yeah. going to happen, like having a baby, for yeah. example, you know your life's going to change. Yeah. The first year of having kids, 
is a big shock to the system. But you do your research, don't you? You read a few, you know, right, there's going to be some changes. We're not going to be sleeping as much. You're probably not going to like each other for the first year of having children. We're probably not going to talk to each other. We're going to be sharp with each other. It's going to be financially dry. You, everyone knows, and billions of people have done it behind us, and billions of people are going to do it in front. But you actually can be talked through the process because everyone's done it. And the problem is, building a commercially profitable enterprise, taking it to the next level, is actually the path not well trodden. Mm -hmm. So you need to find the podcasts, find the books, and they are all out there. Mm -hmm. YouTube is here. Podcast. I mean, when I started out 20 years ago, the resources to find this stuff out were next to nothing. There was Dragon's Den. So you, they wrote all a book each. I'll go and buy all them. Yeah. You know, uh, there wasn't YouTube, so I didn't really know there was another load in America in Shark Tank. So I had Theo Bethesda's book, Richard Branson's book. And I've heard of this bloke called Alan Sugar, but that was it. Yeah. That was my resource. And now, I mean, I, I put loads of content out. I've, um, you know, I help people on my podcasts and stuff. But I am one of 10,000 people probably on the planet that are giving great stuff out. Mm. But most people just want to Netflix and chill, don't they? Yeah, it's true. It's an interesting point on the, like, now there's almost like the information overload. Everything's there to, and it's actually free. Yeah, so and you have to be careful. Do you think that's maybe where, like, mentors actually come in? Somebody you holds you be, accountable on what to learn. Well, you need to know the difference between mentorship and coaching, and we'll, we'll come on to that in a minute. But there is a lot of fake stuff on the internet that's get rich quickie and we're human beings and we we as a race we love convenience that's why we invented electric windows and air conditioning yeah you know it, why we invented sat nav because we didn't want to read the map anymore why we've invented the internet you know all of those things we are a process of ever ever more convenience but actually business is not convenient to build but you so like people watch my stuff and I've just said on there it's a marathon not a sprint yeah. you're on a 10 year journey here gang actually you've got some pain where you're not going to earn money and other people yeah. will oh, I just don't really want to listen to this yeah. it sounds like it's going to be a bit tough you know well it is yeah. but it is worth it the delayed gratification I can absolutely tell you if you choose the right path and actually it's you know is it that bad to wait six months mm -hmm. to then triple your income mm -hmm. but most people don't want to put the six months in of it's going to be a bit painful six months, other than any high-level entrepreneur that I meet. Um, now, the bit that I was talking about, what was the bit that you I You were going to say the difference between a coach and a mentor. Yeah, the difference between coaching and mentoring. So I don't think I, I, I'm a coach, but I think I like to mentor people because I've done it, and I'm trying to tell people what I've done. Yeah. But a coach makes you do it. Yeah. So, you know, it, a coach will understand about the process, but they'll follow up and make sure you're doing it. Like a good... I know, a running coach. Yeah. Come on, you know, do, wear the, you know, do this. This is the stuff. Uh, uh, have you done your training today? Yeah. You know, have you eaten the right stuff? All of that. I've got a PT. Here, think, He's yeah. coaching me, yeah. and I need him to make sure I do it. Otherwise, I just won't do it, right? Because yeah. I don't like doing it. Um, but I like to think of myself or my content like your non-exec director yeah. in your business. Have you done this and this and this? But I'm not making sure. Have you completed the task? Yeah. And that, that sounds like um, entrepreneurship versus management, again, in a different yeah, setting yeah. almost there, because the mentor's probably more entrepreneurial. They've done it. They know how to do it. Yeah, they can well, connect you with different people. They can point you in the right direction, but yeah. they're maybe not be quite as good as like the small details that yeah, a management yeah, well, Richard, team would usually Richard do. Richard Branson's mentored me. He doesn't know he's done it. Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah, I've read Theo Pafitis' book, you know, about selling businesses when he, and buying failing businesses. Yeah. He's mentored me, but he doesn't know he's yeah. done it. Yeah. He doesn't know he's done it. And I've probably mentored, you know, millions of people yeah. on all my content, but I don't know I've done it. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm, I love that that is what well, I think it's a really good thing to do for the human race. If you put your hand up and say, I want to be better, yeah. it's easier than ever to get here because most people want convenience. Mm -hmm. Like, do people want to go and work seven days a week for a couple of years? Well, I did. Well, I actually done it for 10 years. Mm. And, and that's what it can take. Yeah, that's what it can take. And most people you probably did it quite I quick. want my weekends off and I, I don't want to work in the evening. Well, and that's fine because there will be people work. who, it's just like, just don't moan about it then. Yeah, like yeah. if you don't, if you if you just want to own a job or you just want to be employed, yeah. then it's like, it's just like, just go on with that kind of thing. Absolutely. But, but I do think, I do think, you know, you've got paid for mentors and coaches and I think that absolutely has a place. You know, non-exec 
directors of big companies have been around since the dawn of time and non-execs can make a big difference to businesses. But actually, if you see someone that's very successful and ask them, you know, whether maybe they've been a successful bank manager, you know, some bank managers of big corporate banks yeah. have retired, you know, maybe say, look, can I just meet up with you and have a coffee with you and just pick your brains? You know, you could be walking out with golden nuggets yeah. more than anything that you can ever imagine. And I think there are lots of retired, super successful people. They've got lots of time, lots of cash. Maybe they got to the top levels of senior management, but not quite entrepreneurship, and they'll give you some time and, and give you a different view to an entrepreneur. And you just take it all, don't yeah. you? And you box yeah, it all up. And you make it into your own thing. Yeah. You, you've always been big on saying you are the average of the five people you surround yourself well, that's with. The, that, is, that is the phrase of phrases. And I think what I was picking up from that there, which some people might not understand, they might think that you need to then go out to network and find like, five multi-millionaires or five people who's done whatever you want to do but actually you can have Richard Branson on audio or you can have James Sinclair on his YouTube channel and he's yeah, going to tell absolutely. you this stuff at a relatable level and you know the best analogy for that is if you you know if I go on a park run and well I haven't done a park run I do do some running but if I've done a park run that will be my fastest time because I'm running with people that yeah. are working faster it's or a, if you it's play a race actually yeah at that point as well. yeah and if you play golf and you're an amateur and you play with four pros that would be the best game of golf you've ever played just because you're involved you come up to their level but you, you'll still be the worst out yeah. of all five but you will push yourself up. And that's why I always talk about that. It's not my, it's a, a, my absolute, my biggest mentor that I never met was a guy called Jim Rohn. And that's his phrase, you know, the, you become the average of the five people you spend most time with. And there's some great lectures on YouTube of Jim Rohn. Um, uh, and I, I do think like, if you lived with me, moved in with me, lived in my house by the end of the year, my philosophies would have even more moved yeah. on to it and the, your I business think, will yeah. be bigger and better because I think of even it. just listening to your YouTube channel the wee things just pop up because yeah, yeah. you, re you repeat it until it sticks yeah. and, it, and it's, a, it's a good way to do it and yeah the good thing what, the reason I you know I continually try and sharpen my saw great book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is you know the, the, the analogy here is if you're going into the forest to chop down trees yeah. spend more time sharpening your saw mm -hmm. and you'll chop the trees down quicker mm -hmm. yeah because you've got a nice sharp instrument yeah. and and what I always think is that you become better when you teach. Yeah. And so one of the reasons I make all my YouTube content and write all the books and write my newsletter is because I am making sure that thumbs I, up. Yeah, I'm making sure I'm becoming yeah. better by doing this yeah. stuff. Because yeah. I can't go around and say to people, you know, make sure you employ managers and never employ a bloody manager. A manager yeah. You know, make sure you produce your numbers and never produce my numbers, yeah. you know. Hold your account about it. I don't say to people, you should buy in some businesses and then never buy a yeah. bloody business, yeah. you know. I, I want to be a process of actually doing the do. Yeah. We spoke about those, um, like, the five people you surround yourself with. Another thing I've heard you saying, which I think is worth sharing, is the, the other side of that, which is the negative people, like the mood hoovers, as yeah, you would usually really call them. them. Just the great trying. entrepreneurs yeah. and business owners, you know, that they, you know, you're not a tree. If you don't like where you are, move. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just that simple, you know. Yeah. If you are around, and most people are obsessed with gossip, you know, and they love negativity. Yeah. And when you meet high level entrepreneurs, they just nah, stuff that, I'm off. Yeah. And they just, you know, they leave home early because yeah. they've got mood hoovers in their loved ones. Yeah. And that happens a lot, by the way. Yeah. That happens a lot. So they go, no, no. Off I go. Yeah. But that, that takes balls, and I get that. It does yeah. take balls. And actually, lots of the mood hoovers will be the people that are your family. Yeah. That's sometimes the closest people to you. It's, it's, I hate saying it, but it is yeah. It is true. There is, um, I, I had uh, Mike Green on the podcast, and he was um, mm. talking to us around wolf packs. And he was like saying, like, when you leave almost like the mood hoover wolf pack as such, or the negative wolf pack. You go from that and then you're going over to the other wolf pack, which might be like entrepreneurial or more positive or whatever yeah, yeah. it is, but there's this part in between where it's about a lonely track yeah, where yeah. you're the lone wolf going, they don't really want me back. Yeah. They're, I'm not really quite at that level yet, but you've just got well, to go I, through it, haven't you? And high level business ownership. So once you go to employ people, you are you are in a more lonely pack straight away. I always love saying this statistic. In the United Kingdom, 
We only have seven and a half thousand companies that employ more than 250 people, which literally blows my mind. Yeah. I'll say it one more time. So there's only seven and a half companies employing more than 250 people. That's the size of a village controlling the whole entire workforce, basically. It's crazy. And 250 people is, it sounds a lot, and it is a lot, but only to have 7,500. We've got nearly 70 million people live here, which is just mad. And what's the stat on the businesses who pay VAT? Did you, yeah, we, you pick up yeah, on I mean, that? Yeah, I mean, um, there's only 30% of businesses are paying VAT. Yeah. So the data so, shows us that people are forcing their business so, not to go so into seven, that. 70 percent of businesses are basically staying under like 85, 90, 90 grand, whatever yeah, it is, yeah. 90 grand now. And but that's, that, but that's and a mindset that, thing, And that's been it? an artificial ceiling because they're like, oh, stay under that because of... So I'm quite controversial on that because I would rather the VAT threshold was brought down to £10,000 because I think it punishes people that want to go further. Yeah. So let me, let me explain. If everyone was paying VAT from a £10,000 threshold, no one would be worried about staying at the £90,000 yeah. threshold. Everyone would go, well, we might as well go to 300 grand turnover. Yeah. That'd be great for our That's economy. That's interesting, yeah. That would be great for our economy because at the moment, they're all just like £89,999. Yeah. You know, do everything we can because they're all worried about a bit more paperwork. Yeah. But the paperwork, because of AI and software like Zero, doing a VAT return has never been easier. Yeah. Um, and also, when you become VAT return, you can claim all the VAT you haven't claimed for the last four or five years. So you could get a nice yeah. fat check where, as soon as you come in. And then you, you've pushed yourself to be better. Yeah. You've pushed yourself to be better. And most people don't want to do it um, mainly because they're probably dodging the tax man yeah. and they're doing you know, this classic, oh, I've got a company over here for materials, a company over here yeah. for the, the work. You know, all of that's going to get found out. You, know, you, might as well, you might as well go for it yeah. or just be employed. Yeah. I think on the, the the first year that I, I went um, limited and VAT registered and, and did, did things properly, it was like we did over 600k that first year, which was like, yeah. seemed amazing, but we made a loss on it. Yeah, but so that's another would, pain But year. then we would never have got to the it's multi like million pounds with a few hundred grand like on the bottom, someone. which you can have every year after that. So, yeah. like, I have been through that sort of, yeah. that yeah. area, There's that little, slump where you've, yeah. you've, got to, you've got to get through. That was amazing. Thanks for sharing so much. Um, where's best to get you if people want more of them juicy tips? <laughs> yes, I'm on Instagram. Business. I'm on Instagram, James Sinclair Entrepreneur. I'm also on YouTube, James Sinclair, and I've wrote some books. So you can get all that stuff. And my website, I, I write a brilliant, I, the thing I'm pushing at the moment is my newsletter. So I write a letter every Monday. Yeah. Um, uh, they're just in my musing stuff that's happened in the previous week, things that wind me up. Um, People, you know, I think it's become quite a, a cuddle to yeah. business owners. Um, and it won't take you long to read it, but you can apply for that on my website. And that's completely free as well. The YouTube and the podcast. I coach business owners on the podcast of all industries. Yeah. And it's like number seven in, in Europe under entrepreneurship now. Yeah. So people are listening to it. They're loving it. You was on it years ago, weren't you? Yeah, so. yeah. I was, I was stuck at the £2 million pound ceiling there now. And now I'm just stuck at the £3 million pound ceiling. So, so um, but no, I appreciate it. And uh, just to back that up again, uh, James has, has mentored me without knowing it. And then now he does know it because I'm sat here with him. So oh, that's very kind um, of you. Yeah, if you, if you want to grow your business, then, then stay tuned in. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks, mate. Cheers.